All right, Paralegal 110, or I'm sorry, 112, Legal Research 1. Um, this is the week three guide. This uh, guide actually, and the slides that I'm going to post can be used to go back to kind of refresh yourself all the way through because this is going to be sort of concise overview for what we're going to do from weeks three on. We're going to delve into different things, secondary sources, case law. We'll focus specifically on exercises on case law, specifically on exercises related to statutes. Um, but this course, as I said in week one, um, and then this week when we met, is unique. It's unique to teach. It's unique to learn. Um, some of you may be aware that you know I I uh, have the what I'm not muted am I I don't believe I'm muted <laughs> um, I think that's an error message some of you are are aware that um, that. I had done some various things in my background, one of which was I coached basketball for um, since college and high school, grade school, college basketball. Um, and along the way was certified to train weight training, physical conditioning, um, and done a lot of that. And I still do that to some degree. Um, I do a f <laughs> something that some people call fat camp or people are working in service in law enforcement every once in a while I'll do that when there's it's usually around the time when people need to be tested they'll come to me and want me to put together a little plan to kind of kickstart them. Um, and there's a lot of correlations between coaching and teaching and mentoring and um, but most of those things that I did in that part of my life don't really come into play in this part of my life or this part of my teaching, except in this course. As I said, this course requires skill development, knowledge development, as we talked about last week, it requires you to use the most important muscle in your body and the most important computer that you own, your brain. And so, um, you know, I'm going to break down for you a lot of things that we've talked a little bit about, things that I want you to always go back and draw upon. And I'll be very concise with those things. But really, from here out, it's going to be um, a departure from the normal class kind of guide or lecture or the things you're used to, and more of me pushing you. Um, with very guided exercises, pre-class and post-class and discussions in between when we meet in class. But um, as I've been stressing, there's no easy way to get this. It is not something that you can do um, by reading about it. It's not something that Siri or Google or some, you know, voice, whatever the hell they're called, Alexa, they can't do this research for you. They can't figure it out. You have to figure it out and you have to get good at it. So I'm going to push you to, to develop your skills. And that's what I'm going to coach you. I'm going to mentor you, but I'm not going to hold your hand and guide you through. I'm not going to give you lectures that you can write down and magically memorize and spit it back and, and get an A in the class. And again, I don't care if you get an A or a C in the class. What I care about is you grasp the research processes that we lay out. You do the things that we ask you to do. You use the tools that we ask you to use and you do your best job at following that process and you know, using your skills to help the lawyer find the best answers, um, the answers that they need you to help them find. So, um, I posted these slides on, on Blackboard, and it starts off with an overview of the research process. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about some practical guidelines for beginning your research. We're going to talk about 
effective strategies, um, developing a plan and establishing guidelines for ending your research. And then we'll delve a little bit into both statutory and case law and, and the processes there. Um, which then we are going to, over the next few weeks, as I talked about this last week in class, we are going to spend uh, a lot of good ride time, practice time. So first off, there's really two inflexible rules with legal research, okay? Um, when I say inflexible, it means there's no exceptions. And you have to follow these rules when you perform legal research to ensure that you comply with your ethical duties and your competent representation of your client. Um, and they're inflexible. That means no excuses, okay? You can't get around these things. If you shortcut these things, bad things will happen to your boss, your client, or you. So the first one is pretty easy. You must read the full version of anything you intend to use as legal authority. Okay, you can't skim it. You can't have the computer pick out the keywords and only read the sections that have those keywords in them. You must read the full version of anything you intend to use as legal authority. You need to master it, own it. You keep hearing me say that, own it. The second one is you have to verify, shepherdize, key site, those things we've been talking about, those verification tools, all primary authorities, and then review anything relevant that is um, opened up in that process of verification. So if it leads you to other things, you have to go and follow that trail to those other things. Reading, verifying those things, and repeating that process until you are at the end, you are at today. There's nothing newer, okay? We'll get into the verification process in coming weeks, but as long as you do these things, you will find the best answers. Um, and you'll move towards solving your legal research problem. But these rules are inflexible. You must read the full version of everything that you intend to rely on as legal authority. And you must shepherdize or key cite or verify that what you're saying is legal authority is still accurate and valid legal authority. And be prepared to find anything that's fresher, newer, more up to date. Okay? Two inflexible rules. Now, Sometimes it's difficult when you're first learning legal research to narrow down the possibilities to figure out what the, the parameters of your research might be. So here's some core issues or some things that you can think about as you analyze your assigned legal issue or problem. One, criminal or civil law. Is it criminal or civil? If you don't know the difference between criminal or civil, that's really not what I'm supposed to be doing here, right? You you came here for legal research. So if you don't know that, then I guess, yeah, you need to ask Siri. It's fairly simple, but you need to know that by now and you need to take ownership of it. And I'm not gonna waste my time here, but you should take ownership of it and, and know the difference between those two. Um, and then be able to, in this part of your career and near learning legal research, you should be able to look at something and determine, is this a criminal issue or a civil issue? And once you figure out what criminal is, anything that's not criminal is civil. So that's fairly easy. The next consideration, the next core issue, jurisdiction. And we've been talking a little bit about jurisdiction, and that's something that's new to some of you, but it's something that you've done a little work with. You understand how we determine jurisdiction. You understand the geography of jurisdiction. So that's one of the things that we would also consider as we're trying to sort out what this legal issue is. 
it's important to be able to determine, okay, criminal or civil, state or federal. We broke down some state jurisdictional considerations in uh, this last week in class based on the geography of the state of Illinois. You know, if you have a state court issue and you're based in Peoria County, we broke down what that means as far as court authorities that would have jurisdiction over your particular case. Jurisdiction is definitely something you need to know. Um, one of the other core issues, and it's something that you'll develop as you develop your language and your understanding of, of other things, uh, those of you in family law, wills, trust in the states, this semester, civil litigation in the fall, what type of action? Now, the type of action is really going to focus on what sort of remedy, what's being sought. Now, if it's a criminal case, we're only, we're looking to punish. So this goes more towards the realm of civil things, the spectrum of civil things. Is someone seeking punishment? Are they seeking fairness, equity? Are they seeking money damages to be compensated? So what's the action? What's the, the thing sought? Um, you may also, as another of the core issues, look at defenses, depending on what side of the case you're on, especially. So, um, you know, what defenses are available or what remedies as the final one? What remedies, what, what the outcomes might be? It also goes with the, with the cause of action or type of cause of action. If you can determine the type of cause of action, you can typically connect the remedies. Um, so that's how you narrow down the possibilities and help you figure out the breadth of your research, where you're going to go, what it looks like, and have a better understanding. So always come back to these considerations. If you're struggling, I can't figure this out. I don't know what the question is. I don't know what the issue is. I don't know where to look for authority. Well, go through this analysis and it will help you. Some other questions that'll help you develop um, some of your descriptive words and your phrases for your research. Who's involved? Okay, who is involved? And when I say who is involved, I'm not talking about their names necessarily. What I'm talking about is what is their relation to the issue? What is their role? Did they sell something? Did they buy something? Did they steal something? You know, what, what's their relationship to the issue? Who are they in relation to the issue? What is the issue? What is the issue? If we can figure out the issue, we can start to develop descriptive words. The issue, if we can figure out the issue, we go back to the what we just talked about, a cause of action um, and remedies. That will be fleshed out there as well. Where did it take place? Okay, where did it take place? Always relevant. Think about in terms of geographic jurisdiction that we've been talking about. Where did it take place? When did it take place? Um, why did the issue develop? Really think about that and analyze it. Break it down. Break down the facts. We always talk about, uh, especially if you're in my evidence course right now or taking that course, you know, it's great to tell me what the court held, but Unless you're breaking down the facts for me, that particular case, none of us learn anything. So own the facts. The facts are what give us that real opportunity to understand the issue. Um, why did the issue develop? And how did that issue arise? Um, those will kind of go hand in hand, but think of it in that term or those terms if you can't figure out why the issue developed, how did it arise? You know, what caused it to surface to, to become an issue? Now, this isn't something that um, I guess you'll necessarily be too concerned with right now, but maybe based on some comments and 
discussions I've had with some of you, you may be struggling with um, when you stop. And we'll revisit this um, in, in different contexts along the way, but generally, so I wanna give you some reality. When do you stop research? You know, when do you stop? Well, I think I've already alluded to, um, you stop when there's nothing more to find. No stones unturned. You're at today, whatever today may be. And um, meaning that there's no new case law that has come out at this point in time of today. There's no new statutes. You're as far as you can go today. But in some cases you'll find in practice and in law office management, you may have this discussion, economics will govern the scope of your research. Um, economics is sometimes driven by the client, most often driven by the client. So we wanna be efficient in what we do in research. That's why I've said a couple times now, have a notebook, have a notepad, have a pen, keep track of where you are, where you've been. Um, in the practice of law, you're going to get stopped. You're not going to just sit down and say, okay, today I'm going to research blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to sit there and dun, 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 until I get to the end, until I'm done. Doesn't work that way. You're going to have a phone call. You're going to be called to the lawyer's office. You're going to have another client meeting. You're going to have something else that's going to interrupt you many times before you get to the end of that particular research project. Um, so don't plan on it being done. It's just not going to happen. Keep track of what you're doing because the client's not going to want to pay for you to redo things or do things multiple times because you didn't keep your work, research and work organized. So beyond that one, the economics, the practicalities of economics and research, one clue that your research is complete is that you keep bumping into the same authorities. You just keep coming up with the same stuff. That means you're going in a circle, right? Okay, that's a clue that you're, you're at the end of the rope. You're at the end of the process. Um, as beginner researchers, you'll often lack the competence to stop from this simple fact that you are convinced that there's this one perfect case or this one rarely found answer, this one specific very on point answer. Um, and, you know, in, in my, all my years of legal research, I can tell you that it's very rare that you find that clear cut, um, best the answer. A lot of gray area in the law. And if there wasn't, then I wouldn't need you in class, you wouldn't need me to teach you and you wouldn't have very good job prospects. It's one of the things that keeps us employed in the law. So it's a good thing. But that is one of the things that you'll struggle with until you grasp some confidence, gain some confidence, that you won't know when to stop because you're looking for that one perfect thing. Um, you always want that one perfect thing. I still want the one perfect thing. I still look for the one perfect thing, but eventually um, you get more confident and comfortable with the fact that, you know, you keep again, go back to the bumping into the same things, you're not going to find it. Now, if you follow the process all the way through, that also makes sure that you've done it all the way through and that one perfect thing isn't there. Um, and then the other is, as a general rule, you're going to need fewer authorities to support a well-established principle of law and more authorities to discuss an emergency, emerging area of of law or one that is very fact specific and constantly in conflict. So um, keep those in mind. If it's something that's well established, a well established principle of law, you're going to need fewer authorities. You're going to want the most recent and the best, right? The Supreme Court. Um, so keep, keep that in mind as well. Let's talk about statutes for a minute. Um, again, you know, or you should know, how federal and state laws are enacted. Um, 
you've all had multiple courses in your lifetime and supposedly you took the constitution test whenever you took it grade school and high school or both and i don't remember when it is but you you're sitting here today and and the assumption is that you know how you know a bill becomes a law if you don't know then you know google i'm just a bill uh the uh schoolhouse rocks version and and watch it it'll refresh your memory that you know how a bill becomes a law okay how we get legislation enacted um you should know how statutes are published or codified and you've had some practice or looked at some statutes just in this class but you've looked at statutes in other parts of your life um, you know that uh, statutes 735 ILCS 10 slash 10 or 5 slash 2-1005 is the Illinois Code of Civil Procedure um, section that deals with summary judgment motions. 735, that's the chapter, all right? Federal or state or statutes are codified with a, a chapter section, a number that starts it off. The ILCS stands for Illinois Compiled Statute. That's the name of our statutes. Okay, and then there was a series of other numbers behind that that don't necessarily make a lot of sense all the time. And um, if you're thinking in terms of of, um, of common outlining practice and numbering. Um, but there's some delineation of a section, subparagraph, paragraphs and subparagraphs, and a way to keep track of and gets back to what we talked about with citations, allowing you to find the map to, to that statute, allowing you to find that statute, the map to that statute. Um, you have to practice your research techniques for locating statutes. And that's one of the things we're going to do this week. We're going to focus on federal statute. Um, we're going to start with the constitution and, a, and one of the amendments of the constitution. And then that leads us to a related federal statute. And then we're going to wrap up the week with case law flowing again from that same line. So we'll keep it all together, but it's going to be a bike ride that's going to be a little difficult at times. Um, but it provides you with practice. And then remember the role of case law and the necessity to find case law when you're attempting to understand the application of a particular statute. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. We'll talk about it forever and ever the rest of the class. Um, tips for using statutes effectively. Review the entire scope of the statute governing your topic. Generally, terms used in the act are first defined. So definitions are going to be one of the first things you'll see, followed by the rules announced in the statute, and then the penalties or violations or the expectations of the statute. You should always assume that each word in the statute is there for a purpose and that the words are given their plain meaning. Um, you should always assume that. As you read more and more statutes, you're gonna go, what? What did that say? Why, why did they put all those words in there? They didn't need to put all those words in there. They're sometimes confusing. So that's why we examine cases and those cases, the courts discuss the statute to determine how they would interpret the statute and the courts help us understand the statute. In particular, how to apply that statute or how that statute applies. Remember that it's the providence of the court, it's the province of the courts to apply and interpret statutes and even to strike down those statutes is unconstitutional. That's their role. When you're using the statutes, um, if you're in Lexis and you find a statute, if you were to page down, scroll down, 
from those statutes, you will find something called annotations. Um, annotations are just other resources. They're publisher provided resources. So they're not um, primary law. They may lead to primary law. It's a secondary type source provided by the publisher. In our case, we use Lexis. So Lexis has provided these annotations and they end up being references to uh, sometimes articles, sometimes other secondary sources. But then a lot of times, more often than not, we're looking for, and what I like to use them for is a direct link to case law. And they really, they do a good job of organizing those references by jurisdiction. So if I'm looking in an Illinois, at an Illinois statute and I, I scroll down um, and I have a case that's in Bloomington in the fourth appellate district, well, any related cases will be broken out by that district and sometimes topics. So I can look for keywords. Very valuable, good stuff. Okay, very valuable, good stuff. Um, don't overlook those resources, but take some time to get used to these resources. They're there for you though. Um, they, they provide you with di direct links to uh, cases that interpret the statute, typically through the use of one sentence summary of the case or how it applies and a case citation. And because you're in Lexis, click on the link and off you go to that case. Uh, the danger there is that you, um, you lose sight of where you were. You know, you got to keep track. You got to keep track. It's a lot. You remember my discussion about being in the seven story law library at law school and pulling books from all the different floors. Um, that was in some way a little easier than the click, click, click. Because I'd have those books and I'd have them stowed away somewhere until I needed to get my copies and put them back. Something to keep in mind, but there are extra features as well as the cases, historical notes, library references, bar and law review journals, um, you know, things that assist you interpreting in, in, in interpreting that statute. Um, sorry, I gotta have a little water, still the Rona is hanging on. I'm not out of quarantine yet, but I'm feeling a little better. I rode the spin bike through the, the Yellowstone caldera, which I thought it was fitting since I was binging on Yellowstone, the series, uh, when I could barely get up off the couch with the Rona. So I digress. Case law and statutes. When people think about the law, they tend to think in terms of statutes, regulations, those things that attempt to have a direct uh, control over our lives, the things that most impact us. When disputes arise over the meaning of statutes, it's up to the courts and judges to interpret those statutes. Judges' interpretations of those statutes, opinions, decisions, or cases, they're as, and maybe more important to understanding what the law is than the words of the actual statutes itself. So if you find a statute that seems to address your client's need, their fact pattern, their issue, you always want to take the next step. You stop, you reorganize, and then you do case law research to determine what the courts have said about application of the statute to similar facts or issues. Now, how do we find cases? That's gonna be part of our journey in the coming weeks. Well, we can use encyclopedias, treatises, the ICL volumes. Some of you are using in other classes as your textbook. Um, to obtain some background information on the topic we're researching, and then they always lead us also to cases. Always consider statutes. We just talked about annotations of statutes. Since something is likely codified in a statute, 
um, or a regulation, you can find the annotations and the annotated code will take you to cases. If you can't locate any cases through annotated codes or treatises or secondary sources, uh, the traditional secondary sources, well then try the non-traditional ones, Google. And we always want to validate or shepherdize or key site our cases and statutes to ensure they're still valid. Follow the process all the way through. Finally, um, as far as this discussion goes, keep, use, and revisit. Keep, use, and revisit these resources, the resources I provided you with, the resources we provide you with in the class, the resources you get out of your text. Use those resources. They're not a one and done. They're not a look at it, think about it, discard it like we do in so many other classes. Keep, use, and revisit these resources. Legal research is like riding a bike. It takes balance, it takes skill, it takes determination. The knowledge and skills you develop here will be used in other classes. More importantly, you know, what you develop here is going to be used for your entire paralegal career. Your entire paralegal career. All right, so let's talk a little bit about where we're going this week as far as an assignment. Um, we're going to use the internet as our secondary source, I suggest you use Google. As you do that, we've introduced a, a certain um, Ivy League law school that has provided all of us with some very good resources. We use it for our citation resources. And you may remember that I, I said at some point that it was uh, the first to put the US Constitution on the internet. That was one of the first things on the internet. So think about that and it's gonna help you narrow down the best secondary web-based resource for the first part of this assignment for this week. Now, I need you to um, remember some things that we've said in the past. So when you're looking at web-based resources, they are not all created equal, not by any means. Ideally, we want to focus on and stay with the .govs, government created or provided um, secondary sources or resource, web-based resources, or the EDU from the educational institutions. You know, Bill and Ted's excellent recitation of the law.com is not probably where you wanna be. That said, there are all sorts of public interest groups that may provide you with or help you get to, um, you know, uh, the law or help you find a statute or find a case. The problem is in the interpretation of those things. So you want to make sure that it's an objective interpretation. And how do you uh, make sure it's objective? Well, that's up to you. And you're going to have to sort that out or figure that out. But um, be sure that you, you, know, you do that, focusing on the .govs and the .edus first. This is a .edu site that I'm trying to get you to figure out here and to get to. Um, this assignment has three parts with multiple subparts. So it's imperative that you practice patience, breathing, organization. Okay. Um, it's, it's not going to be that difficult if you just go through it. So first, you're going to use Google and um, you're going to look for the recommended website for the US Constitution as we as I just laid out. Um, determine which portion of the U.S. Constitution refers to firearms. And I want you to tell me specifically what it says before um, and provide the exact wording. 
And then I want you to paraphrase and provide your own interpretation of what, what it says. If you've never seen this amendment, uh, it may be a surprise to you. And even if you had, if you stop and read it and take a good look at it, it may be a surprise to you. Using the citation resources provided to you, I want you to provide the correct citation. Then I want you to go back and using Google, do a search to determine if there are any federal statutes that seek to regulate the manufacture, transfer, and possession of firearms. You should find two primary candidates. And when you do, I want you to focus on the most recent of those two. This is all spelled out in the assignment on Blackboard, so you don't have to write this down, but I thought it's important that we say it at this point as well. Um, remember our guidelines and preferences for using the internet as a secondary source and how we sort out websites to eliminate interest or bias regarding given law or given law or preference. So the EDUs and the .govs. And you can use those sources to help you understand or, or get your um, bearings on this statute. And there'll be plenty of those sources out there. Then I want you to provide a brief summary of the purpose or intent of this statute, and then using your citation resources, provide the correct citation for the statute, and be sure to include the effective date of the statute with your official citation. Now to do that, I suggest you go to Lexis, and we'll see if you actually listen to or watch this guide on that point. After you do that, I want you to save the document as a PDF and post the PDF um, by the start of class in week number three. And then there's a post-class assignment that we'll discuss in class. Um, and that'll lead us onward on our, our rides. Um, I, I kind of get the impression that things are coming together just by you know, how you're, you seem to be reacting and what you're posting. Um, it's the, other than the second half of last spring, when we were forced to be completely remote, it's my first time starting. You know, I had eight weeks of teaching this course remote, completely remotely. This is the first time I've taught the first half of the class remotely. So it's a new experience for me as well. But uh, that's the impression I'm getting. And again, it comes down to the work you put in and the effort you put in. And if you do that, you put in that effort, we'll get there, okay? I hope you stay well. If you need anything, reach out to me. And otherwise, I will see you on Monday night.